The 1v1 interview series is a production of the Boss Rush Network of Podcasts. Visit bossrush.net to listen to our podcast and read our articles, game reviews, and more. You can also follow us on Twitter at Boss Rush Network to stay up to date with our content. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to 1v1 here on Boss Rush Network. I'm your host, the Enlightened Excited Eddie V. Joining me from the Turn by Turn podcast. Now, everybody, I got to introduce the special guest properly because he covers, well, him and his co host Chris covers some of my favorite RPGs. Of course, our uh, elite black agent, Mr. Dan Murphy, has been on the show. Um, they are He is from 5-6 Media. That's where Turn by Turn podcast is on. Please welcome the star. That's just not a fantasy. He's the one. The only. Daniel McGar. Hello, yeah, good fun. sir. <laughs> yeah, hey. Thanks so much for having me. This is... This is- very cool <laughs> ah, thank you for coming on i was so excited uh we talked on twitter and i was telling daniel that i love his podcast him and chris's podcast because they talk all things uh jrpg srpg uh american role-playing games um they started out the show with a top five rpg list <laughs> which is like y'all coming out hard <laughs> Uh, but it's so good to meet you, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, um, before we get into the show, do you want to introduce who you are and a little bit about the podcast? Sure. So I'm obviously Daniel, as you so kindly introduced me. Um, so the Turn by Turn podcast um, has an origin story, actually. So I was doing, um, I fell in love with RPGs at a young age playing a game called Shining Force that... Um, <gasps> Yes, w- one of our listeners will will have know will know what that is, and um, it's a like an SRPG TRPG and um, Sega Genesis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and um, I wanted to do a podcast, but I wasn't sure what topics would be good, and I d- found there wasn't a Shining Force one, so I created Shining Pod, which. Um, was specifically just Shining Force. And as you can imagine, something with much, such a small audience, there were not enough people to like create a community to like make that exist long term. So around episode five, we, we turned off the lights in the old recording studio and packed up <laughs> for about uh, a, a year and a half. And then I still wanted, still liked the podcast idea, so I wanted to keep it going. So I thought, well, maybe if I just like generalize it to a, all RPGs, that might be able to find an audience that would be captivated enough to keep it going. So um, halfway, th- about halfway through the pandemic, um, I I got the podcast itch again. I don't I don't know if that's a real thing, but I got it and. Um, I, <laughs> and I um I messaged uh David Geisler, who is the head of Six Five and the host of um another, another Zelda Zelda podcast. Po- yes. Funny thing about him before you go home. Uh last year I got to meet him uh because we did the another Zelda podcast. We did the quiz show in mm-hmm. the summer with Celeste and uh Stephanie and just a whole bunch of people, even Dan. And it was a good way to meet everybody. We were having a barbecue at his house. And we literally had a conversation about Zelda that could have been a one-hour podcast. I I now know that when I talk to David, you might as well just start recording because we're going to talk. <laughs> uh, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David is a really awesome guy. He so. is. Um, I was hoping to do with Shining Pod what he had done with another Zelda podcast, but um, audiences being what they are, there is a Zelda audience. There's not really a Shining Force audience. So sort of feathered out. And then, like like I was saying, halfway through the pandemic, I just out of the blue decided I would message him on Twitter. Hey, I have this idea for a show. 
do you want it or like would you want to produce it and uh it just so happened to be like a perfect gap in their schedule for how they release their shows so he said yes and then um my co-host for shining pod um didn't really have the time to commit to um playing other rpgs enough to talk about them so uh during its long tenure of existence shining pod i had had chris on as a guest being the other shining force fan in the world mm -hmm. so i had reached out to him saying hey would you want to do this and thankfully he said yes and now we're a podcast <laughs> all right awesome hey, everybody know uh shining force is a uh, strategy role playing game by sega um the uh, one to two i believe came on sega genesis around 1993 that's 93 94 um and there were there were more popular in Japan um, than it was in America because we didn't have strategy games like this. Fire Emblem really didn't come here until the Game Boy Events. Yeah, about the Game Boy Events it came in. So Sega kind of beat them with the uh, strategy role playing game on console. Um, and it just took a while for it because we was waiting for Shining Force 3 to come. And it never came. Most of the series is still in Japan that everybody won. It's funny uh, because as a series, um, after Shining Force 3, and then they did these other games um, called like the Gaiden series. Yes. Like the Sword of Hagia and uh, Final Conflict. And uh, after those, they sort of like took the playbook and like threw it out the window and started making other games. Like mm -hmm. there's like a there's a couple dungeon crawlers. There's like totally unrelated like style of games, but there's like this very like loosely weaved narrative <laughs> beyond the games. So there's like Shining Force Feather and like Shining Force Exa, and like some of them are just sort of rehashes of the original games uh -huh. with like different styles. But it's very strange where that series goes, and it gets more like data sim kind of like how fire emblem like has added in more like dating and things as the series progresses yes so <laughs> it's really fascinating that they still use like the same like franchise tag for these other games that are coming out that seem so distantly related they might as well be something separate well can i ask you um were you looking at a lot of uh sega rpgs uh back in the day or um currently or anything like do you ever get a feeling that you would like to know the history of the rpgs uh series that, that was on sega and their uh consoles mm -hmm. i think the sega and like the super nintendo house some of the best rpgs i don't know yeah. is that like a hot take i don't know i don't know well well because the sega so sega when I said Fantasy Star, Fantasy Star was kind of problematic um, because it didn't have a map in that yeah. game. And you, and it was first person, and you literally, as a kid, you know, you would have to draw everything, or you literally had to call the Sega hotline system, and they would send you a map so you get through the game. You know, because it was so difficult. They didn't, they didn't really plan it. And I know definitely for me as a kid, of course, I knew the Legend of Zelda series, of course, but I didn't get to play Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest or anything like that. A lot of the Square RPGs, I didn't really get to play. I even played, I played Gauntlet in an arcade and on the NES, uh, but that that was kind of a different RPG. So when uh, the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo came, you know, Squaresoft were the big people on Super Nintendo with a little bit of Nintendo themselves and uh or and also enix um but sega was doing a lot and then when sega cd came out you had working design that dropped so you had lunar you had um uh this magical game um uh, and i cannot think of it but working designs was the square soft of the sega genesis era mm -hmm. you know but you had like fantasy star two three and four no Four, I believe. Yeah, we'll like say Fantasy Genesis. Star Online, sort of that like weird. I think it started at like the GameCube. <laughs> it's the GameCube and Genesis and Sega. Uh, 
uh, Dreamcast, I think. I that believe. Sounds, that sounds right. Yeah. But they also had like Beyond Oasis, which was like a top down RPG, action style RPG, which we, everybody, we're going to get into because I, I definitely have to get your take on why The Legend of Zelda isn't considered as an RPG, but a game, and I don't know if you heard of this game called Alundra on hmm. PS1. Sounds familiar, but I don't think I've, I haven't played it. So Alundra was. Uh, this game where you know you were like um you would get into people's dreams and their dreams were actual actual dungeons and everything but because it came from working design people called it an action rpg mm -hmm. but it's, it's so it's kind of designed in the same way as the zelda games okay sure so um, but we'll get a little bit in a little bit later into that. So, but then you, I kind of want to ask you, how did you get into video games? So, uh, my first video games, um, to age myself maybe a little bit, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm 30, so I we had the original Game Boys growing up, and the first game I really remember playing beyond Tetris was Link's Awakening. Yes, yeah, did you, did you play that when it was originally coming out? Mm -hmm. I had it on the uh, the original Game Boy, and then I had it on Game Boy Color. So I'm 41, so I grew up during part of the Atari, Nintendo, Sega ages. <laughs> so I was the Nintendo kid, so of course I had to get all the Nintendo consoles and handhelds. So, But Link's Awakening, yes, I own both copies uh, of that game as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's such a great game. To oh, it's so, it is. It is really fun, but it can be pretty difficult because I, I was playing when I was like six or seven. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. following it was always pretty tough. I, yeah, I think once I learned uh, about The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, it did seem this like the same gameplay for Link's Awakening. I understood what it was, but I didn't know what that game really was about until I started getting stuff. I'm just like, oh, this is such a good game <laughs> to play on the go. It's definitely one of those like head scratchers, like what is happening type games. Yeah, because I didn't, I never understood. I'm like, why am I collecting uh, musical game, musical instruments, and not the Triforce? I was so used to collecting the Triforce parts, but I started realizing that they were taking the Zelda series into a whole different direction. Mm -hmm. And I think so. that's what's interesting about it in it when it was released. And we can get back to RPGs. I just. Um... I like to rant. <laughs> that, um, what does a boss rush? <laughs> <laughs> that um, when it came out, it was a, fir a first Zelda game for so many people that it twisting the Zelda formula is just so funny that so many people cite it as their first game. And their first game was a twist on the genre already. <laughs> yes. And I, I don't want to ruin the ending for it, but it kind of connected a little bit to Super Mario Brothers 2. Uh, and did it and I didn't realize it till I actually completed uh, Link's Awakening. So I'm going to leave it there. You, I'll let you guys figure that out. If you haven't played it, it's available for I love the Switch version. Oh, that that version is amazing. My mouth was just a gate throughout playing that whole thing. I'm just like this is the remake that is just phenomenal and it just stands out, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a better remake than Final Fantasy VII? <laughs> yes, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I think they they captured the spirit of it and it looks just beautiful in motion. And Final Fantasy VII Remake feels too much like a movie while they try to add a lot of stuff but change it, you know, while still... Because fighting that house as a boss in that arena, I paused the game and I screamed at, and yeah, I have tweets on it cracking up to be like why am i fighting this big house as a boss and i it took me an hour to beat him i was like this is literally insane <laughs> like it turned into it like, literally turned into a kingdom hearts battle and i'm just like this wasn't a boss in the game this was a regular enemy that you know 
you could grind and fight and stuff. But I'm like, I'm just, I'm finding these, you know, these things going through this arena battle and a mechanical house comes out. I'm like, what is this nonsense? And then half of my magic wasn't working against it. So I'm just like, great. I can't devil may cry these mugs. I gotta, you know, it's taking all my energy off because the shop system is a mess. Like, I, I'm <laughs> like, you don't, you're not prepared for what that game was. And I'm playing on normal for mm. Final Fantasy Remake. I beat it already, but I was just like, okay, I understand the delays and everything. But this is just too, I, underst I understand the high quality of the production and everything, but this is just overdoing it. And I feel like Link's Awakening on Switch was just so complete and perfect that, you know, they still were able to add new elements uh, clean up some things, but it still felt engaging like you played the original version or the uh, DX version on Game Boy Color. So mm -hmm. it had, I think the Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening had more heart to it than Final Fantasy Remake had heart. Final Fantasy VII Remake really just felt like a action-packed, high production that just, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it went for visuals and nothing else, and I think that doesn't do enough. Where mm -hmm. Link's Awakening is just, I guess, felt more comforting, more enjoyable to do. Mm -hmm. My thought on the Final Fantasy VII remake is, it just feels so smooth. Yes, like it, like it does have that like animated movie quality about it, where it's like um, like hyper realistic, and everything is just perfect. But then it drags out that perfection. We're just like, okay, we can end this fight. No, I got a fifth form that I'm about to do before. <laughs> wait, a fifth form? I'm like, come on now. <laughs> that feels very Final Fantasy, though. <laughs> to, to, like, give you, like, 17 of, like, kind of the same thing, but a little different. Like, even yeah. with just, like, random encounters where, like, you might, like, be walking for about two minutes and have, like, 34 encounters. Like... <laughs> That's like part of the experience of Final Fantasy is like getting bogged down on something that should be rather simple and doing it for two hours straight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that's my take on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, uh, did you, what, so do you think Final Fantasy VII Remake was better than Link's Awakening? Uh, I haven't played the Link's Awakening Remake. <gasps> Ooh, yes. Um, you need to play it. It, it interests me because it does have that weird, like, Snoopy sort of look to it. Mm -hmm. That Peanuts movie that came out, it looks yes. exactly like that. With, like, we called it, uh, someone called it Zelda Mobile because, like, uh, the Playmobil uh, toys. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you know Playmobil? Oh, I know Playmobil. Okay, I was, okay. I was to say, I'm like, you don't know Playmobil? Yeah, they <laughs> called it Zelda Mobile Graphics. So, like, <gasps> that is so true <laughs> with that Charlie Brown penis. The, the so. giant eyes and <laughs> yes. like, the, 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 the oblong faces. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I kind of want to ask you, how did you get into RPGs and more so since the turn RPGs? Because that is, you know, turn by turn, um, that is kind of like, a traditional role-playing game mechanic in RPGs or JRPGs when we think about it. Um, but there's more to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't stray far from the from the homeland. So uh, it's all started with Shining Force. <laughs> okay. And um, so I had a, like, uh, one of those really old, like, Windows, like, 95 like early dell 2000 computers and i uh -huh. bought the sega smash pack that had wildly great hits like shining force and uh chameleon kid uh -huh. zone yeah <laughs> it was like a a 12 in one game sort of system so no, i, I remember played, i probably played like 10 of those games on there i remember comic zone oh goodness that game that game's hard <laughs> it is <laughs> And as a kid, didn't really appeal. So I kept look, like trying the different games. And then I had tried Fantasy Star 2, and that felt like something made in like Microsoft Paint <laughs> at the time. So that didn't really catch on. And so then I played Shining Force, and I loved like finding all the weird characters and that um, 
you could go along and you could get like a weaponized like armadillo and like it somehow fit but in like fire emblem or different things like that it's all mm. it's mostly a human cast and you might have like an occasional dragon in shining force like you never know what's going to end up being like a partner for you so True. Yes. it had a lot of appeal that way to the point where i actually hadn't played much fire emblem because um i was just so into the shining force that i hadn't bothered to try it and chris got me playing the fire emblem games so i've been sort of binging those but um i really love the tactical map games mm -hmm. so that stuff always appeals like i love the idea of final fantasy tactics tactic ogre all those like top down sort of games where you get like a very peculiar cast of people uh -huh. so it just well i, I kind of uh, i i was wondering this um because like tesco rpgs were uh in a sense oh, sorry about that tesco rpgs in a sense were kind of um not pretty big curly kind of like in the 90s and early 2000s you know you it, it was the two like when final fantasy 7 came out that rpgs became a big um thing for america with jrpgs because it was literally such a niche genre until final fantasy 7 came out even though like a lot of us knew about chrono trigger and secret of mana and earthbound and all of these games a lot of people didn't get on board with them because they were too um to them they were too challenging they did another mechanics and everything. So I kind of want to ask you, do you, can you easily grasp the mechanics of an RPG in a sense now, nowadays, did you, do you think you would have in the, in the olden days? Yeah, the, the tagline, the unofficial tagline of the show is that I suck at gaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for a long time, no. Now that I've started like playing them all the time, every waking second for the, the show, Yes, I pick it up pretty quick now. Every once in a while, there'll be something funny. Like uh, in Bravely Default 2, getting used to that default in Brave Commands. Mm -hmm. That took a little bit of getting used to, but once I got it, I figured it out. And then if you grind enough, you can just brave three times with all your people, and then you don't have to even like strategize at all. But um, a lot of the, like the older games, like you were saying, like Earthbound, those games are incredibly difficult and even just knowing where to go and what to do are so it is not remotely obvious sometimes what you're supposed to do in those older ones <laughs> so um yeah um earlier rpgs they uh they have this kind of difficulty curve to them. um you know final fantasy 3 slash 6 um was kind of uh, a good one to understand but you know you didn't have the bravery default kind of gameplay you didn't have the chrono trigger kind of gameplay you literally had turn after turn you know uh, uh, enemy went my character went back and forth and everything and dragon quest or dragon warrior back in uh back in the day on the in nes um that took more grinding to get through and everything mm -hmm. um what do you think of classic rpgs compared to modern rpgs i think they they seed in a lot more hints nowadays than if, you, mm -hmm. if you're just sitting playing earthbound for an hour you might not get very far because you just have no idea how to get the plot to go forward but with with things nowadays it's like oh you should go check out that closet in the south building downtown and then like it has built-in hints now whereas before it was pretty brutal of like almost on the level of uh like the original legend of zelda game where you're just walking around kind of looking for something to happen uh -huh. <laughs> what well, yeah because i think nowadays you got a lot of cutscenes to progress the story mm -hmm. you know uh, you still got that grinding mechanic but like you to get something like chrono trigger where in order to really progress in that story, you got to time jump to that era. Um, 
But then it gets to a point where you're tire jumping everywhere uh, before you actually get it to the end. Because in, in a sense, Chrono Trigger was kind of the first um, evolution of role playing games. It was mixing traditional RPG with some action stuff, action to it because you were able to see the enemy instead of just warping in and everything. Um, what did you think of Chrono Trigger and the new plus, uh, new game plus? Like, how that become a staple in the industry? Um, were you surprised that it came from there? I don't think so, because I feel like Chrono Trigger holds up phenomenally well. Mm-hmm. And um, you always, it's always sort of the gold standard of what like an RPG or even just a video game in general can be because it has, it, it has so many like modern things they push in games now that you can tell every game was inspired by it because Chrono Trigger has, I think, 13 and separate potential endings. So that's what you're seeing in a lot of RPGs now. Like Triangle Strategy with, that I just played has like four endings. Mm -hmm. And then Three Houses has like 47 different potential endings. <laughs> <laughs> so it just seems like it set the bar so high that just everybody Im imitates it now. Even in our season two of Turn by Turn, we've been talking to some game devs mm -hmm. about their games and everybody... Everybody mentions Chrono Trigger, and they mention Final Fantasy. So, uh, setting man. the bar so high that it's just, it, like, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's something, because I think I mentioned to you, um, there's a game called Elemental Gimmick Gear, or Dreamcast. Mm -hmm. And it's such a... It's, it's in that vein of Zelda, in that vein of Alondra, where it's an action RPG um, and you find these pieces, but you're a robot. Um, you know, or you're a guy in this robot who lands on this planet and you're trying to find out what's going on, what happened. Uh, but there's a thing that you could turn yourself into an egg. That's why it's called Elemental Gimmick Gear Egg. Uh, and you spin around, and that could be part of your attack. But there are parts that, to open up a door, you have to land down and spin. So there's, like, some kind of offbeat RPGs. Um, but it kind of reminds me of, like, Secret of Mana and uh, Chrono Trigger, like, in this graphics in a way that it looked and everything. So it's kind of, when I think, I think... Definitely with me being a boss rush, being like the old time gamer playing almost everything. Uh, I look at Chrono Trigger as a game that I think it's, it, it started off a lot of um, discussions about how a RPG, RPG should be discussed and kind of designed. Um, and then you see elements in other genres and everything. Did you kind of get not upset, but did you kind of get rid of out that uh, games that use RPG elements to it um, not consider as RPG? Uh, I don't think it really bothers me. I think it, it's pretty flattering that the games I like are so incredibly good, everybody has to steal from them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that part of it I really like. That... But do, I, okay. I wonder if people would be like, oh, okay, I like this wildlife RPG from Ghost Recon, whatever, Wildlands, I'm sorry, from uh, Recon. But do you think that's just like, okay, you left this RPG mechanic. Would you try something like, let's say the world is with you? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And people still would sometimes would be like, no, that's just too nerdy uh, to <laughs> say. Um, do you kind of find that weird that they would play a game with those elements but not actually go into the genre playing? So like your 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 fringe RPGs, like the world the world ends with you is an RPG, but it's like kind of like a a head tilt RPG where mm -hmm. you have to squint to see it be an RPG because it does have those like you pick your different pins, but you're just sort of flailing around on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, okay, we're gonna be talking. The world ends with you at some point. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, I fear. I got to get the one on Switch so I could play. I heard it's bad, but I 
I got the the second version, the new game, but I gotta start it. Um, and I gotta I want to get the first game because I haven't played it on uh, the DS. I kind of want to see what it, what this all about. Now, do we talk about Kingdom Hearts? Because <laughs> I don't know if you are interested in playing that series. I haven't played any Kingdom Hearts. It's always interested me because it's like the Disney the Disney game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you did you think did you think Square Enix went kind of off the handle with that series by putting like most of the main story on uh, Nintendo consoles and pretty much part of it on PlayStation, even though PlayStation is the leading console for that game for that series well now it's on xbox and switch but like mm-hmm. do you think because i've never had known a rpg that would have about 13 or 50 some games and it is complete nonsense of a story mm-hmm. that's always sort of been the the turnoff of why i haven't tried it because it's just like what even is it <laughs> like it's the game where you can run around as mickey mouse sometimes but beyond that, like I, does it really classify as like a full RPG? Like, I mean, it is it, it like, <laughs> I mean, it, it it has armor in it. It has a battle system that, like, you know, that you can level up. Um, like it has those elements that make it a, a JRPG, like an action style. Um, but it's kind of just like I. It's so weird because the story is problematic in a sense because it's so confusing that you're playing the way that it, I mean, the way that they jumped around in that story to understand it completely when it's full, you got to play all the games because part of the story that there's a game, I think it's uh, three, uh, 352 over two days that is running alongside um chain of memories which is a game on game boy and then that leads it to kingdom hearts 2 but it's just like wait a minute you just made this out of the blue Mm -hmm. to go into kingdom hearts 2 and kingdom hearts 2 had already been out by then so it's kind of weird on how and then you can't really understand how everything actually started until Mm -hmm. you play the one on psp and it's just like th- this is nonsense of a story, like on how this game is designed. But with the collection, you could go in order. But like, how you does that confuse you? Um, oh, in a sense, definitely. I know that um, it feels like the Legend of Zelda timeline is the you get sort of like oh, there's like the three possible solutions, and if you play this one. You're on the the fallen hero track, and then this one you're like the greatest hero track, and it always seems like video games have a really really hard time keeping continuity, especially when you get past say five games. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of RPGs feel like they control the narrative a little better until you get to that like fifth or sixth game, and then it's just. Totally, totally random, and like they want the continuity to match because they want to keep releasing games with the same mechanic styles. But mm-hmm. then they have to introduce time travel. Like I know Fire Emblem has some pretty wacky time travel, like Earth switching mechanics when it gets to like Fates and Awakening, and yeah, it just I don't know why it's so hard for them to balance it. But, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is, like, 27 movies or something. <laughs> and it's, like, like there's, like, nitpicking and stuff. But generally, it follows a pretty pretty straightforward narrative. And then you get video games that reach game five. And it's, like, they just have no idea how to keep it going or change it. Has there ever been a, uh RPG story that just let... You, you, put the, you finish it, you put the controller down and be like... What the world was that? That feels like an Earthbound thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> like, and, what What was the plot of this thing? Yeah. 
I feel like summarize Earthbound is a very hard question. <laughs> it's kind of hard for me. Like, I understood the first one. I'm like, okay, this is good. I love what they're going with. And then when it just started to get into the other games, I'm like, uh, what the world is this? <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Um, well, uh, Monster Hunter, uh, something like that from Capcom. Because um, I, I think we haven't touched on the Capcom RPGs, like Breath of Fire and Monster Hunter and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think of those kind of RPGs? So, depending on when this episode comes out, um, we have a Monster Hunter episode coming out um, pretty soon. So, <clears throat> keep an eye out for that. Um, it was actually my... So, it's Monster Hunter Rise that I played. And it was actually mm -hmm. my first in the series. And it was an episode that Chris wanted to do. So, um, Again, the joke is that uh, Chris is the brains of the show, and I just like have the mic on to say "yep" and mm. So, <laughs> um, it's always fun when when there's Chris episodes because I get to "yep," mm -hmm, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> with Monster Hunter Rise, um, I thought it was a fantastic game. I had a lot of fun playing it. I love that you get a cat and a dog. I think we were yes. talking about that on Twitter a little bit one day. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Because um, I love the fact that they your uh, your palico uh, and your paladog, uh, no, your palamute, um, they could be in different outfits. And then when you get the Amaratsu from Okami as your palamute, I was just like, oh, that's so cool. I love this. <laughs> and everything. I thought that was that was like uh, like really cool for that. Um. I know for me, when it comes to Capcom titles and I, the Legend of Zelda season, uh, Oracles and Seasons and, and stuff like that were really good. But I love Breath of Fire 3. I I think that is still to this day one of their best RPGs um, mm -hmm. today. Um, Saga Frontier is, is uh, Square Soft. Oh, that game is just, oh, good, 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 good. no. <laughs> So, because you haven't been to the PlayStation 1 RPGs yet, like their lineup, because you haven't played Beyond the Beyond or anything. No. Okay, so there is a quest that you get with a... And I do not like Beyond the Beyond. I can tell you that. There is a quest that you get a character and he's automatically poisoned. <laughs> and you have to try to get through, I think, about five or six hours of the game to get the item to stop him from poisoning. So he okay. could die. He could be, he. every time you resurrect him or anything, because you can't use no antidote or anything, you can't heal him or anything, he continues to have poison until you get it off of him as a quest. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, you don't make an RPG like this or anything. So I just let him die. I just kept him as a dead person in my party because I couldn't switch him out with anybody. I kept him as a dead person in my party until I got to that point and I was just like, I got three more hours before I actually get to heal him to get rid of it. I'm not just stop playing the game. I, would, I never went back to that game. Yeah, it can be um, pretty defeating if if you get stuck with something weird like that. It's always It's always nicer when you have like the Fire Emblem games always give you like a super character at the beginning mm -hmm. to kind of help you balance the power while you're getting the other mechanics together. So yeah. I think it's always nice when they, they throw you a bone and give you give you a little something rather than making all your characters level one, like one hits. So, Well, is, is there an RPG that you, you are fascinated and, you know, or interested that you want to play? So, Tactics Ogre is a big one that I want to play. And then I want to play more of the Dragon Quest games. Um, there's a lot. I've been playing through Super Mario RPG, and that's been weirdly fun. Oh, nice. In ways that I wouldn't think. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, What do you think of Western RPGs? Like games like Fallout and Dragon Age and Mass Effect? Mm-hmm. So I actually haven't played Mass Effect, but um, oh, okay, that's another one of Chris's favorites. But I think it's good. I think um, you can, it usually feels very obvious <laughs> <laughs> that it's a Western game. 
And uh, from what Chris has told me, Mass Effect is pretty pretty weird story too. Yeah, it it is, but I think even though whatever the story may be or how you take it, I think it's the moral choices that you do make and it's the characters that you come about. Because I think the cast of the Mass Effect games are is really good. For RPG that it is, American RPG, the cast is super strong. I think you you will find some favorites if you decide to ever give it a try. Now, mm-hmm. do you do a lot of PC um kind of RPGs or do you do console and uh, PC? Uh, it's mostly console. So I have a Mac computer, which means I don't get any good games pretty much. <laughs> so most of the gaming happens like on my Switch or um, em- emulated. <laughs> or um, we, we, we saw it other ways. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Other ways. Other ways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I, I we don't got much time, and, I, and I'm gonna let you go because you know you probably just got home from work. I know you want to eat and stuff. <laughs> um, one of my favorite questions to ask everybody is just like, what is your favorite cereal or your favorite snack or anything while gaming or getting ready for work or anything? Ah, favorite snack. That's a good one. Um, I always enjoy your snack tendo sections oh. on a pal block. Thank you. <laughs> uh. I'm a big pastry guy. I like donuts and stuff. Ah. More than I should. <laughs> okay, so do you guys consider it called the Long John's something else? It's the Long Donut with the frosting at the top? Mm-hmm. Did you guys long... call them Long John's? Yeah. Those are amazing. Okay. Because mo- they're bigger, so it's more satisfying as well. Ah. I, did you get them at like a grocery store or did you got like a certain donut shop outside of Duncan? <laughs> it's it's mostly Duncan up here. In, I'm in New England, so it's pretty much only Duncan. Ah, okay. It's a lot of Duncan. And Duncan donuts like are, are not like a top tier donut. Mm-hmm. They're like the donut in a pinch, which is generally like what I'm in. So I settle a lot, but there's probably a lot of really good home homespun donuts nearby is there a specialty snack uh only and found only in new england that you like um hmm. so there's these i don't think it's new england only but um whoopie pies are amazing Ooh. that's like uh for those who don't know i feel like most people might know at this point but for those who don't it's basically like a, a cake base with like a diabetes amount of frosting in the middle, <laughs> and then like like a cake top. Oh wow! <laughs> kind of like smushed together into like a burger, and um, a lot of the homemade ones of those are really good. Ah, uh, did so you like, drink? You drink it like with milk or ice cream, or do you like a oh, milkshake yeah. or? Yeah, you could do that. <sighs> you could like feel your heart slow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. Those are pretty good. We're also, New England is also pretty known for their pie, which having eaten a lot of local pie, there's some really good pie up here. <laughs> like what, like apple pie, lemon pie, is there kind of... So uh, apple or blueberry are your two key pies in New England. Really? Mm-hmm. Probably more blueberry than apple. Why blueberry? Uh, we have a lot of blueberry fields up here, so... Ooh. They're pretty readily accessible. So you have like fresh berries, which always make for a better pie. Mm-hmm. So you can get some really good pie up here. <laughs> ah, I need to make it, let me write that down. New England trip snacks, blueberry pie. <laughs> yeah, like if you're, I don't know why you would be or why anyone would be, but some of like the, the small little towns in Maine have mm-hmm. like the best pie you'll ever have in your entire life. Ah, uh, the, the the pie that will put you to sleep. In. <laughs> exactly, like when you wake you wake up and it's that one little crumb in the side of your mouth. <laughs> exactly. So, like, if you can't find the town on Google Maps, they probably have the best pie possible. <laughs> uh-huh. Like, no. if they're off the grid, you know their pie is going to be amazing. Is sort of the rule. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you, Daniel. I want to thank you uh, for joining me uh, for this discussion. Uh, can let let people know where can they find the podcast and find you? Yeah. So you can find the podcast um, 
on wherever podcasts are sold as the Turn by Turn podcast. And uh, you can follow our random happenings on Twitter at the Turn by Turn pod. Um, for me specifically, I'm less interesting than because I, I basically run the Turn by Turn Twitter, so I'm more on that for gaming stuff. But um, if you want my personal one, you can find me at Magar Mentions to see what things I've been mentioning. Um, but again, I'm, I tend to be more observant than vocal on that one. So, Ooh, okay. Uh, and you guys can find me on Twitter at that retro code. You can check more of 1v1 at Bosch Rush Network on our website, boshrush.net, and on our YouTube page on Bosch Rush Network. Um, you may hear me on a future turn by turn episode. I'm trying to get on so I can uh, talk about Secret of Mana. Um, and if Konami ever releases Suiko, then <laughs> I could come on to talk about Suiko, then was the game back in the day. Oh. <laughs> so um but with that everybody have a great week have a great weekend thank you daniel um for coming on talking all things rpg um and everybody check out the turn by turn podcast if you want to learn about rpgs or you want to uh see what these guys think about them tune in and hear them out they have some great episodes they are in season two at this moment but you could go back and this is all to season one also <laughs> With that, everybody, have a great weekend. Uh, have a great week. Open oh, you listen to the podcast. And we'll see you next time on 1v1. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs>